the canon is one of the uh, methods by which uh, the church communicated uh, orthodoxy. Uh, we talked last week about which came first, orthodoxy or heresy. And uh, many uh, scholars point to our historical records and they see heresy first and then uh, they see writings about orthodoxy. Well, we, we discussed the reasons for this uh, last week that uh, uh, many times the church fathers would write about the heresy and then that heresy would motivate them to uh, clarify what orthodoxy is. And of course, uh, we, we uh, established the fact that uh, Jesus left orthodox teachings with his apostles. Uh, those apostles, and uh, uh, of course including Paul, then uh, uh, spread that, that orthodox apostolic message uh, as they established the new churches and as they uh, wrote down uh, responses uh, to, uh, to the situations that were arising in the churches uh, that they established. So, uh, if we believe that orthodoxy is true, then we must believe that orthodoxy always has been true from the beginning. But that uh, the, um, uh, the apostolic writers uh, de developed the written record of orthodoxy uh, over a period of time. All right, in a number of ways. We'll get to canon in just, uh, just a minute. We, we talked about these very quickly last week, but I didn't want to just come back and talk about uh, some of the ways that orthodoxy was communicated even before uh, the, the canon was established. And one is the rule of faith, the regular fidei. A definition of the rule of faith is a confessional formula uh, that summarized orthodox beliefs about the actions of God and Christ in the world. Now these, these formulas followed a general pattern. And we see some of these written in the scriptures. All right? Um, I'm going to look up uh, Romans 1, 2 through 4. James, I see you reaching for your electronic Bible. If you'd look up the passage in 1 Corinthians 8. And Patrick, I bet you can look up 1 Corinthians 15 on your little uh, magic machine. Uh, so uh, we'll, um, we'll look at these, we'll look at these uh, scriptures uh, together. All right, when Paul opened up the letter to the Romans, uh, he talked about the gospel of God. And so for, for Paul, of course, gospel on one hand means that message of salvation. But on the other hand, the gospel of God is a little bit more comprehensive because it also includes the rule of faith. And uh, this gospel, uh, as Paul said, God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So in these very few verses, uh, Paul really compacts quite a bit of theology. All right? What do you, uh, what do you learn about the Scriptures? God ordained them beforehand, and what do they talk about? Jesus. Jesus, all right? What do we learn about Jesus? All right. What do we learn about his humanity? He was a descendant of David, all right? He was born. First of all, he was born. He had birth like a human being, and uh, in his birth, he was a descendant of David. All right, that, that, that attests to his humanity, it also attests to his lineage from David. All right, then uh, also it says that, uh, what does it say about his divinity? He's declared to be the Son of God. The Son of God. All right, 
um, all right, with power by the resurrection from the dead. So what do you hear from resurrection of the dead? One, he died. Two, he resurrected. All right. Uh, so that's uh, those are important uh, statements about who Jesus is. Goes on to talk about the spirit of holiness uh, and Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have what do we have here? We have an uh, you know uh, uh, you know a reference to the Trinity, not explicitly stated that uh, God is uh, one substance with three persons, but we do have uh, in these, these two verses, we have God the Father, have Jesus Christ the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. Okay, so my word, look at this, just three verses packed with, uh, with information, and uh, so this is the rule of faith. All right, James, if you've got uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father of whom all things came, and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. All right. So, James, what do you see there that would uh, uh, fit into the rule of faith? Uh, God, is, God is one. Amen. All right. Good. That uh, Christ is okay very good so in this verse uh, again he, he he doesn't bring up the Holy Spirit but he talks about God the Father Jesus the Son and uh, talks about the, the divinity of Jesus that he shares divinity with God the Father and it also talks about uh, we exist through Jesus so uh, it's it's uh, Jesus is the sustainer of the universe all right Patrick uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, 3 through 8 uh, for I delivered to you as the first reported what I also received that I passed on to you as concerning on the, uh, the resurrection. But notice how he introduces it. I delivered to you what I also received. All right? There's many times when we see uh, uh, Paul talk about delivering. I delivered the faith. I delivered the gospel. <coughs> He's passing along uh, a body of uh, information uh, that he had uh, received. So we have Christ's death for our sins. So we see this the substitutionary atonement. His death uh, was, was, was not, uh, his death had meaning, the meaning of, uh, of, of being atoning, atoning for our sins. It was according to the scriptures. So again, we see the importance of the scriptures that uh, foretold uh, his death and resurrection. And then we have his appearances. Okay? So, even before we have the canon specifically, even before we have uh, a, a body of writings collected uh, uh, with its authority uh, agreed upon, we already have uh, rules of faith being developed. All right, the content of the rule of faith as we look through uh, various rules of faith, these few in the scriptures and then others that we're going to look at from, uh, from the early church, the content is creation by Father God prediction through the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the incarnation uh, by uh, the conception of Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, Jesus' ministry through preaching and miracles. All right, furthermore, crucifixion for the purpose of salvation, resurrection, ascension, the proclamation by the Spirit's power through the apostolic church and the return of Christ for the resurrection of the dead 
and final judgment. Now, obviously, the content that I'm listing here uh, goes beyond uh, those rules of faith that I've selected out of uh, the scriptures, but this content is contained in uh, the canonized scriptures, but we see even before uh, the, uh, the canon, we see these, uh, these uh, early church fathers that are communicating uh, a rule of faith that includes most or all of the emphases I just listed. And these are, are available to you in, the, uh, uh, in your uh, revised notes on heresies. So I won't go through them uh, today, but you can see there, there are 14 instances uh, there. And I'm uh, grateful to uh, a friend named uh, Brian Lipson who uh, presented a paper on this topic at ETS a, uh, a few years ago. All right. Uh, there, uh, there's uh, uh, information about uh, Orthodox faith contained in hymns. And I'm not going to go through these. Uh, well, actually, I think we may have done this last week, looking at these different scriptures. Uh, probably, mm, maybe the best known is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Colossians 1, of course, talks about uh, the, um, uh, the, the, that in Christ dwells uh, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, Ephesians 4, 8 um, and uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 3. There are some, there are some sections there that biblical scholars look at and believe that they were uh, fragments or recitations of hymns. But uh, Paul is writing these letters uh, in, the, um, in the 50s. And so these hymns existed prior to that. So these, these hymns uh, are, are uh, affirming uh, Christ's humanity and divinity. This is important uh, when we, when we as we're going to talk about, there are those skeptics today who say that the, the early church did not uh, affirm Jesus' divinity until uh, the Council of Nicaea. Well, that is foolishness. Uh, that is, that's, that, those pronouncements are made by skeptics who want to deceive uh, people who, who do not have knowledge and they have, a, they have a hidden agenda. Uh, if, if I can get this video working, we'll, we'll see uh, Dan Brown communicating this through his, uh, his character, Lee Teething, all right? Sacraments. The sacraments uh, taught about the nature of Christ. Uh, Romans 6, uh, 3 and 4. <coughs> I've already got it right here. Uh, this is uh, a, uh, I think this is an important in our understanding of baptism, not only our understanding of baptism by immersion, but, but, uh, but also our understanding of the nature of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. All right. So we see in there uh, the emphasis of Christ's uh, death, his substitutionary atonement, uh, and his resurrection, and our identification with him, uh, whereby we partake of the blessings of his death and resurrection. All right. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, the. Uh, um, Paul's description of the um, of the Lord's Supper. And we all go to uh, Ames Boulevard Baptist Church. All right. So James, uh, uh, you heard Dr. Stewart uh, teach on this uh, yesterday. So um, his passage says, "Therefore, if the whole church assembles together, nope, that's wrong." Um, Grief. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Do you all hear that formula? I received and delivered um, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it. It said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All right, so again, we have uh, Jesus' death, we have his resurrection, and we have uh, the, uh, the teaching about his, his returning. All right, so this, is, uh, this, is, this, uh, this passage teaches eschatology, and that's part of what we do when we do communion. We're not only affirming Jesus' death on our behalf, but we also are affirming his, uh, his coming again. All right, so that's not always emphasized, although I bet Dr. Stewart did. Yeah, yeah. There's an ology in there. There's an eschatology. So you know that, that Dr. Stewart is going gonna, gonna to emphasize this. All right. <coughs> so the sacraments communicate orthodoxy. All right, and then we come on the, uh, the, the canon of Scripture. And again, we have the, um, the, we have this, um, uh, this false uh, presentation of facts that, uh, that the canon wasn't established until the 4th century. Uh, and in fact, in, in some places in the East, it, uh, it actually takes even longer than that. Well, that, that may be the case uh, regarding some of uh, the books of the New Testament in that they were not universally acclaimed uh, everywhere in the church at all times, but uh, we have Paul's epistles being affirmed as early as uh, uh, Peter's second letter when he talks about Paul's writings, uh, plural and he talks about them as, uh, as, as he understands them to be scriptures. Right? So if, uh, you know, if, as, as I uh, assume, Peter wrote this letter, he wrote it before his death in the late 60s, then at the time of the writing of this letter, Paul's, Paul's letters were already being circulated as authoritative. All right? Um, now, the Gospels, we don't have... Um, have attestation quite as early, uh, but we do have quotations from the Gospels from uh, these writers writing around the turn of the, um, of the second century, the middle second century. And so by the, by the Muratorian canon, which is 170 uh, AD, we have the four Gospels, Acts, and Paul's letters. We know that they were being circulated, collected, and considered inspired by the end of the second century. So uh, the bulk of uh, what we know as the, as the New Testament was already recognized uh, as authoritative by the end of the second century. Now, let's talk about canon, what it means, and, uh, and how it was established. All right, the, for all of you Greek scholars, you know the word canon uh, means, uh, means a reed. And this is, refers to a, a plant that grows uh, in the water, uh, close, you know, around the shore. And it's, uh, it's long and it's straight. So straight that uh, uh, in the, uh, you know, around this time, and when they didn't have yard sticks, they would use the cannon reed as a, uh, as a straight line. So it set the standard. <coughs> so the early church used this word cannon in the sense of a uh, rule of faith, or the rule of truth, or the standard uh, by which uh, the church lives uh, its, uh, its life. So today the canon of scripture is understood to be uh, the list of books which are acknowledged to be the rule of belief and practice of the religious community. Now, this is what I want to emphasize uh, to us, uh, that the authority is not granted to the canon by the church. Instead, God placed his authority on the scriptures and the church recognized that authority. Okay? You see the, the, the very significant difference between those two statements. The Catholic Church teaches that the church has the authority over the scripture and therefore only the church can interpret the scripture because it was the church that 
that uh, that gave the authority to the canonized scriptures. Okay, we do not uh, we do not agree with the Catholic Church on on their presupposition. No, we say that the authority uh, is, is is given to the scriptures by God who inspired it. All right, so it is not the responsibility of the church to interpret it. It's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit within each believer. Okay, so God placed his authority uh, on the scriptures. So, um, the, the, uh, of course, we talked last week about Marcion and the Montanists and how uh, different, uh, what different approaches they took to the canon. All right? Uh, Marcion, who can, who can uh, tell us what we, what we discussed about Marcion and his canon? basically cut out everything that Judaized it. You know, he, he allowed Luke's gospel, but he took out all the Jewish references and stuff like that. He, and which letters? Uh, or who wrote the letters? It's really the key. I forgot it. All right. I mean, I, I know also. No, no. Well, well he, uh, he, he allowed... All, the only gospel he allowed was Luke, okay. as, as Kurt said. But uh, whose letters? That's all I said. Paul's letters. Paul's letters. Paul's letters. Yeah, Matthew, what were you saying? Uh, that's what I said, only, but only 10 of them. Yeah, only 10 of Paul's letters. He actually did not include uh, the three pastorals, uh, first and second Timothy and Titus. But he did uh, He did accept uh, 10 of Paul's letters. All right, so he, he limited it uh, too much. And then what about the Montanists? Right. Anybody who's, who's, uh, who, who shows... Uh, inspiration from the Holy Spirit, uh, they would keep the canon open. Okay, so uh, so the purpose, one one purpose of the of uh, that the early church fathers had in establishing the canon was to uh, to uh, include more than Marcion would, uh, but uh, not keep it as open as the uh, as the Montanists. Well, here are uh, some tests for canonicity. One is apostolic authorship or sponsorship. Okay, what do I mean by that? Let's look at the, uh, at the, at the uh, four Gospels. Um, which, which Gospels were written by apostles? Matthew and John. Matthew and John, all right? So what about Mark and Luke? Why do we include them? What is, what's, what's, why was Mark's Gospel considered authoritative? That's right. Uh, we know this from uh, from Papias. He he, uh, he he tells us that Mark was Peter's companion, and that uh, uh, he wrote down uh, Peter's memoirs. Okay, we don't know if he wrote it down while Peter was still living or immediately after Peter died, but nonetheless, uh, he wrote them down. All right. What about Luke? Who is he associated with? Paul. Okay. And so, uh, and so that gave Luke the authority uh, to write uh, a gospel that was, uh, that was accepted by the church. Um, and again, we, we read in Luke 1, 1 through 4, his, his, uh, his methodology. He uh, said, others have taken it upon themselves to write. And so I've, I've read those, and uh, uh, he uh, talked to people that knew uh, Jesus. I believe that, uh, that, that Luke interviewed Mary. I'd say that because if you look at the birth narrative in Luke, it's written from Mary's perspective. It talks about how Mary you know, pondered these things in, in her heart. How do you know that? Because he talked to Mary. Okay? So we can, we can kind of carry that on through uh, Acts written by Luke. Uh, of course, Paul uh, has the authority because he's an apostle. Hebrews, this is interesting. Who wrote Hebrews? Yeah, we don't know. But uh, who was the first uh, person suggested as the author of Paul? Paul all right. So that that kind of carried some weight. But think about uh, uh, what are some other suggestions for authorship of Hebrews? <laughs> Barnabas. Okay. Priscilla. Priscilla. All right. That's, I love that idea. Why else would the, would the authorship have been suppressed except it was written by a woman? All right. Who else? Luke. Luke. Okay. Very good. I can think of a fourth. 
Apollos. Okay, that's uh, George Guthrie, uh, who's really that's, he's made his meal off of the Book of Hebrews. Uh, but at any rate, what do what do uh, what do these four uh, writers have in common? They're associated with Paul. All right, so whoever wrote Hebrews was was either Paul or an associate of Paul. James, the uh, the half brother of Jesus, who was the uh, the head of the, the church in Jerusalem. Same thing with Jude, another uh, half brother. Of course, he wrote, you know, Peter and John, and then John uh, wrote the book of Revelation. Now, you know, more recent scholars have suggested that it was some person known as John the Elder. But, uh, but at any rate, we have apostolic authorship, sponsorship, represented by, by all of these books in our New Testament. Any questions? All right, other tests for antiquity. Um, uh, Shepherd of Hermas, for example, was, was widely used in the church, but uh, when we get to the Muratorian canon, we're going to talk about it in just a minute, uh, the writer said that, uh, that uh, the Shepherd of Hermas is not accepted because it's not ancient. It was written uh, uh, too recently to be accepted as scripture. Public usage in churches had to be used uh, universally in uh, <coughs> churches. First Clement, for example, was a letter that was written to Corinth, uh, and it was read in some churches, but not universally. Uh, uh, and we're going to find that some of the books of the one of the reasons why some of the books are not in some of the earliest canon lists is because they weren't as widely read as others, and then it had to be in agreement in theology with other books. What are the books? Well, those books that were accepted from the first, that is, the Gospels, Acts, and the Letters of Paul. The other books that were uh, questioned at first, uh, they were checked for agreement in theology with those, with those early books. Does that begin with the Old Testament? Well, yes. Um, the Old Testament, uh, let's talk about the, the, the canonization of the Old Testament. Um, the church accepted uh, the Hebrew scriptures uh, in total. Uh, they just carried them over uh, into, into their Bible or into their, their canon. Uh, however, uh, you, as, you, as you know, there are some questions about uh, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, namely those books that, are, uh, that we call the Apocrypha. All right? Um, and... The establishment of the Hebrew Scriptures was, uh, was, I think, probably most permanently settled around 90 A.D. at a council at Jamnia. All right, uh, and of course, this is in this is in you know the Christian era, so this seems uh, late. To us, and in fact, really, when you look at uh, the uh, the history of the Hebrew Scriptures, we find that uh, <coughs> that the books in the Hebrew Scriptures really were established much earlier than this. Uh, we find uh, 250 BC. We have the uh, the Septuagint. Uh, in around 200 BC, we have the establishment of the uh, Qumran community, and when we, uh, when the, the the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered, uh, 1947, 48, uh, they they discovered that all of the Hebrew scriptures were represented in those Dead Sea Scrolls, except for the Book of Esther. Why would Esther be excluded from from these books? There's, yeah, Esther does not mention the name of God. Does that mean God is not present in the book of Esther? Oh, not at all. Uh, God is throughout the story of Esther because uh, uh, his providence is made very clear. When, uh, uh, when uh, Esther's uncle Mordecai says, Who knows but what you have been placed in your position for such a time as this. Well, who would have placed her there? God 
who provided for uh, his people Israel. So uh, God is there, but anyway, Esther is not uh, included in the uh, uh, in the, the documents discovered so far. There's another really significant event that's escaping me. It seems uh, that um, it's um, 160 BC in the uh, uh, conclusion of the um, the uh, uh, the war, the Maccabean War against uh, against the uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and the Seleucids. Uh, but I'm, I can't remember exactly what happened. But anyway, let's just let's just say that that for for our purposes, uh, the Jews understood the Hebrew Scriptures to be uh, authoritative uh, much earlier than than 90 A.D. However. Uh, after the fall of Jerusalem, uh, the, uh, the, 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 what had been the Sanhedrin, those, those, uh, the, the rulership of the Jews moved from Jerusalem to Jamnia, and there they had a, um, had a, a conference to talk about uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. But as they, and as they talked about the Hebrew Scriptures, they, they brought up uh, uh, in discussion Song of, Song of Songs and Esther, uh, seems like one or two other books, but as we read the proceedings, we're going to find that it's not that they are the ones that placed these books in the canon. They simply were discussing books that were already in the canon. So this is too late to uh, be thinking about a canon of the Hebrew Scriptures. We're going to find it's, it's, it's more um, uh, it's more likely to be 200 years before Christ. Okay. So, yes, the church would have accepted uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. And we, we know this is true because we see them all through uh, the New Testament writings, the Gospels, uh, the, the Epistles, certainly the Book of Revelation. So, uh, so yes, they, they and, and, and then again, with the, um, the, um, the Apostolic Fathers, those earliest Apostolic writings uh, immediately after uh, the New Testament writings. Okay? The earliest canon that we have, we call the Muratorian Fragment. Uh, that's because uh, it, it was discovered by a man named Muratori, uh, and, uh, and what he found uh, was, a, was a fragment. It's not, it's not a complete document, uh, but we can learn from this fragment what books were accepted as authoritative at the time it was written. Now, there's some discussion about whether it was written in uh, the late second century or in the uh, in the fourth century, all right? But uh, Bruce Metzger says uh, around 180, uh, and others that I've that I've studied say uh, say 180. I think that those who want to push it later are those who uh, are going to uh, argue against the authenticity of the New Testament canon. So I'm uh, I'm going to go with uh, around 180. Now, I, I say that it lists four Gospels. As a matter of fact, uh, because, of the, because it's a fragment, the very first thing that, the, that the, the writer says is, the third Gospel is the Gospel of Luke, and the fourth Gospel is the Gospel of John. So it really doesn't mention the first and second Gospels. However, uh, I think we can assume that the other two Gospels that he listed were Matthew and Mark. He lists the 13 uh, Pauline epistles, Jude, 1st and 2nd John, Revelation. He omitted these books, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 3rd John. So that's, that's interesting, okay, uh, that, uh, that these were not accepted as, uh, as authoritative by the writer of the Muratorian Canon at this time. All right, now probably the writer was in Rome, uh, and uh, uh, it... We, we do know that Hebrews was accepted late in the West, but earlier in the East. Okay, uh, whereas Revelation was accepted earlier in the West and later in the East. And then it did mention limited use for such uh, books as the Book of Wisdom, the Apocalypse of Peter, and the Shepherd of Hermas. Yes. So the Eric? order that we have our Gospels in now does it come from this, or is it there's something else that? The four, the order well, actually, um, 
Uh, there's probably others in here that may be have a stronger background in uh, New Testament canon. There are different there are differing orders of the four gospels. Um, uh, I was uh, you know visiting the our museum over here, and Dr. Warren was giving me a tour, and he pointed out one Bible that has John listed first. Okay, uh, I think that's exceptional. But, uh, but there are some others, there are other listings other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, um, Irenaeus, writing uh, in 180, writing against heresies, he listed Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that order, and uh, he said that there are four Gospels and no more. Okay? I have some very unusual uh, reasons. It's not the ones that I would have put forward, but uh, he said that it's because there are uh, four points of the compass, uh, and uh, you know the four winds. That's why we have uh, four seasons. That's why we have four gospels. I, I don't know. You know, uh, the the uh, the early church fathers do not always know best. But uh, nonetheless, he does give us these four Gospels in that order. So I would assume that, uh, that uh, the Muratory canon also did. But, but so no, we, we, the, the order that they're in um, is, I, 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 I don't know that I, that I know this for a fact. I have always uh, felt that Matthew was put first because it's such a, such a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It begins by saying that you know the, the, the record of the genealogies of, of Jesus, the Messiah, uh, the uh, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So it just really does connect. Um, most of us believe that Mark was written first, uh, but uh, but not everyone. Some believe that Matthew was written first. We really don't don't know. Uh, but anyway, when I. It, when I teach New Testament survey, which I only do for the men from Bethel Colony, obviously I don't do it around here because we have better experts than me, but at least when I teach it, I teach that, that Mark was written first, then Matthew, then Luke, John, and Luke. All right, uh, the next uh, major uh, canon list uh, is, um, is Eusebius in 325. You see the books that are accepted by all uh, Pauline epistles, including Hebrews, so we have 14 uh, letters by Paul. We have 1 John, 1 Peter, Revelation. Then he listed these books that are disputed. James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Jude. You know, these books are so small. Uh, that may have been the reason for their disputation. Uh, the authorship of 2 Peter, I think, was, uh, was uh, debated even, even that long ago. And then James. Why would James be disputed? Same reason that Martin Luther disputed it. You know, it just seemed to uh, contradict uh, Paul's emphasis on justification by faith. Of course, if you read it carefully, you see that that is not what James is saying. Uh, he's saying that salvation by faith, but evidenced by works. Okay. So anyway, but so we, we those books were actually still in question uh, as late as 325. Books that are recognized. That's people reading. Oh. Books that are recognized but not authoritative are here. I've already mentioned the Shepherd of Hermas. It's written about 140. It's an apocalyptic book. Very strange little book, but uh, it was widely read. Acts of Paul and Thecla. Uh, uh, again, a, a, a story that's uh, that supposedly is about uh, the uh, adventures of Paul along with a woman that uh, followed him around and was uh, was uh, preaching. Uh, celibacy among women. Um, Tertullian specifically mentions uh, this book in his treatise on baptism, saying that it was written by uh, uh, it was a forgery written by a, a, a priest who uh, by, or a monk that was wanting to elevate Paul. But anyway, uh, Tertullian didn't like it. Then there's some of uh, the Epistle of Barnabas. That's, uh, that's included in the Apostolic Fathers, but not written by Barnabas. Didache, a very informative church manual. The Gospel according to the Hebrews, uh, that is not uh, in existence today. 
so these are these are books that are recognized. They are good for edification, but they are not authoritative. If you catch the difference, they can edify, you can learn from them, but they're not authoritative for our way of life. Books that are heretical, the Gospel of Thomas, Peter, Matthias, Acts of Andrew and John, uh, these are Gnostic writings, and so they've always been excluded uh, from uh, authority. All right, then, an important event in the history of uh, the establishment of the canon is Athanasius' Easter letter, which he wrote in 367. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, uh, the chief city uh, in Egypt, one of the major churches uh, in, uh, in Christendom, and he sent out a letter to his parishioners where he lists the 27 books that currently are in our New Testament. All right, no more, no less. And so this is the earliest existing uh, uh, document that includes those exact 27 books. Again, mentions the Didache and Shepherd of Hermas. They may be read, but are not authoritative. Okay, then we have the Council of Carthage, uh, and uh, of course it's in uh, what's now Tunisia, North Africa. Uh, we have a council that, uh, that comes together and is in agreement with Athanasius. Um, however, this is in the West, and there is not a uh, there's not a corresponding uh, council in the East uh, for some time. All right, so that's another reason why someone like Bart Ehrman says, "Oh, uh, the New Testament uh, uh, is not authentic. It's not authoritative uh, because you know its contents were disputed until you know the 16th century." Well, bump. Well, uh, you know, it's really, uh, the, the, the canon was established much earlier than that. The bulk of the canon was, was recognized by the end of the second century, if not soon. Okay? Questions about the canon? All right. Well, I spent a lot of time on that, um, but uh, to me that's, that's important. It's important not only for our understanding of, of how did we get our New Testament, but it's important in dealing with questions that are being raised all the time uh, in, uh, in our society. All right? Bart Ehrman is making a meal off of questioning uh, the authority of the New Testament. And many of our people are reading his books, or at least hearing him, on the History Channel, uh, or A&E, or the Discovery Channel. I'm telling you, whenever they want uh, someone to represent uh, the Christian faith, they're not going to. They're not going to get, you know, John Piper or Al Mohler or uh, Dr. Kelly or any reputable Christian uh, scholar. No, they're going to go to Bart Ehrman or Elaine Pagels or Karen King, those who are going to present a a, a skeptical, secular, uh, humanistic point of view. All right. So we need to be aware <coughs> of, of 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 what I'm what we're talking about today. All right? Yes, Matthew? Based on uh, the last few slides of the, the canon history, as far as history value and accuracy goes, how does that look for the New Testament as far as taking that long? Or in the uh, historical fashion, is that good or is that short? Because you're the historian. Is the way that it, it went about the, the accuracy of the, um, what we have, the, the disputations of what was in it, what was not in it, how does that look historically? Good, bad, I think it, Well, I think it looks very good. Okay. Uh, I certainly have a very uh, high evaluation of uh, the canon uh, and its authority uh, because we see, we see Paul's letters accepted very early and we see, uh, we see the, the Gospels being uh, quoted as authoritative around 100. Okay, so if, you know, if all we, if, 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 you know, if we just, if, if we just take the Gospels and Paul's letters, we've got the bulk of the New Testament. We have the bulk of the rule of faith. All right. Uh, throw Acts in there, uh, which is going to be accepted certainly by the by the end by 180 by the end of the second century. We're having we're having uh, collections of books. What happens is, you know, at the at the uh, beginning of the, the Christian era, uh, we still have scrolls. But it is in that first century that, uh, that we start to have uh, the codex developed, where they take the scroll and slice it into squares and then 
then sew them together. And when they do that, they're able to put uh, a, a larger and larger collections of writings together. And so we start to see the, a book of the Gospels being circulated. We see uh, Acts and the letters of Paul being circulated together. Uh, later on, we, you know, we see the, what we call the general epistles and Revelation being circulated together. But this is all happening by the end of the second century. But if we see it happening at the end of the second century, we know that it has been going on for some time. So to, to, to say that, that, oh, the canon wasn't settled until 367, well, that's, that's not accurate. Athanasius is simply, you know, putting down what has been understood for a long time. And even with Eusebius, Eusebius in 325, uh, you know, with his list, uh, what's being left out is, is, is very small. But then you go to the Muratorian canon, uh, 180 A.D., and uh, it's pretty much got, got everything already in it. So, so I'm, I'm saying by the end of the second century, we have the bulk of, of what we call the New Testament. I think that's good. Right. Yes, Garrett? Well, people that actually use the Bible from our church, the Protestant church, the Catholic church, and the Eastern Orthodox church, they're all three different Bible we even today. And I know there's books that are there's, there's common in all three. So how would you dispute people that have an issue? Because they, they can still say that the Bible is not canonized by that, by that knowledge. But, okay. Right. Yeah, looking at the standard of uh, the, the Protestant Bible, the Catholic Bible, and the Eastern Orthodox Bible. Right. Okay. Well, the, the, the largest section that's in dispute would be what we call the apocryphal writings. Okay. Um, these are writings <coughs> that were, for the most part, written during the intertestamental period. All right. After um, Malachi before the time of Christ, or at least into the, the, the first century, the first Christian century. Um, these are writings that were uh, translated uh, into Greek for the Septuagint, and then um, when um, now, actually, most of them were, were written, I think, were written in Greek originally. So, they were written in Greek originally. And when uh, Jerome translated the books of the Bible from the original languages into Latin, he translated the Hebrew scriptures from Hebrew into Latin. He translated the, the New Testament scriptures from Greek into Latin. And then he also translated these, uh, these, these books... Uh, that, uh, again, that we call the Apocrypha, from Greek into Latin. But when he put them into the Vulgate, which is what we call the, the Latin translation of the Bible, uh, Vulgate because, uh, because it means common. We have the word vulgar, which means common, uh, but it didn't mean vulgar back then. It meant common, the Vulgate. When he, uh, when he, when he uh, put all of this together, he wrote a preface on each of these apocryphal books to say that these are uh, uh, these are books that are good for edification, but they are not inspired. Well, as the uh, as these books were transcribed over and over and over again, those who transcribed them began to leave off the preface, and so that's how they how they came into common usage by the Catholic Church. Now, these books are important for a number of reasons, uh, but for the Catholics, uh, the only scriptural background that they have for purgatory comes from 2 Maccabees. Okay? A lot of you are nodding, so you're probably familiar with this story, but during the war, uh, the civil war between the, uh, or the, 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 the revolution of the Jews against the Seleucids, particularly Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, this story is recorded in the Maccabees. Well, there's a story, 2 Maccabees, I think chapter 14, uh, when uh, Judas Maccabeus and his army come across a, uh, a, 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 a an army of, of Jews who have been defeated in battle. 
and they all, for some reason, are wearing these amulets that uh, are false idols. And so uh, Judas and his, uh, and his soldiers pray for these men that have died in an apostate situation. And Judas Maccabeus gives a talent of silver into the temple treasury. All right? And so, uh, and, and this is approved of by the writer of 2 Maccabees. So when the Catholics see this, they, 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 uh, they affirm praying for the dead and also um, uh, they affirm indulgences. All right? So when it's time, when, when Martin Luther and John Calvin come along and they're, uh, they're reforming the church and opposing this idea of purgatory, praying for the dead, indulgences, uh, you know, they recognize that this section of the, uh, that we call the Apocrypha is, is not authoritative, so they remove it from uh, their Bible. Okay? Uh, now, the, uh, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, in its Counter-Reformation, 1545 to 1560, their meeting, and they reaffirm uh, the, uh, the Vulgate as the official uh, canon of the Catholic Church. And they call these books deuterocanonical. So in other words, they recognize this, this secondary status, but nonetheless, they do give it authority. All right, so this actually doesn't, this kind of, kind of gives an explanation for those who may not be familiar with the Apocrypha, where it comes from. Uh, in the Catholic Bible, well, let me just say that, in a, that there are Protestant Bibles that include the Apocrypha. But you've got the Old Testament, you have the Apocrypha in the center, then you have the New Testament. So the Apocrypha is kind of separated out. In a Catholic Bible, those books that are part of the Apocrypha are just kind of inserted in uh, to, to the books uh, of, the, uh, of the Old Testament. But um, there, there perhaps is a sense in which uh, the canon might be disputed because of the differences between the, the Protestant and the Catholic Bible. Of course, the Eastern Orthodox Bible is, is very similar to the Catholic. There are some, some other uh, additions, I think, over here. I'm not as familiar with that. But, uh, but there's, a, there's certainly a, uh, a strong apologetic for the Bible as we have it, based on what I just explained about uh, that journal. It's kind of complicated, but, uh, but at any rate, I, 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 do, I do still feel confident that, that, uh, that the early church was, was not looking at uh, these apocryphal books, okay? Or at least not, not counting them as, as we're not seeing them in these, in these books that they're listing as authoritative. Okay. All right? Um, okay, the, uh, the Apostles' Creed. The church, uh, in response to the heresies, uh, had, the, uh, had the canon, and then they had the Apostles' Creed. According to legend, uh, each apostle suggested a clause. Of course, we know that's, uh, that's not true because it was composed in Rome about 150. It was directed essentially against the Gnostics and Marcion. And you can see this uh, as you look at its, uh, its different uh, clauses. And it was also used as a baptismal creed built around the Trinitarian formula. And we talked about this uh, the other day when we talked about uh, baptism as a part of Christian worship so that uh, uh, each, bat uh, each baptismal candidate was actually baptized three times. And, uh, and before each uh, uh, immersion, the, uh, the administrator of baptism would ask the candidate a question about that comes from the Apostles' Creed. First, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Then, had, uh, then the next question was a more extended question about Christ Jesus, uh, emphasizing his, uh, his divinity, because he's the Son of God, his humanity, because he is born of the Holy Spirit and of Mary the Virgin, uh, again, crucified, uh, died, uh, uh, his, uh, again, expressions of his humanity, rose again on the third day, 
living from among the dead, as he's talking about his ascension, his seat at the right hand of the Father, and his second coming. So you can see uh, how this, again, an extended statement about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Dwayne? What did, I know it's some of them, you have, uh, in the hell, some of your apostles. Yes. Where did that come from? Uh, much later. I, uh, I, I can't remember the date, but I actually looked that up once. And, and uh, if you look at, uh, at Schaff's uh, multi-volume work on, uh, on the creeds uh, and confessions, uh, he will actually compare a variety of uh, versions of Apostles' Creed. And it is later on <clears throat> that someone adds a uh, descended into hell. Okay. All right, so Grudem is another source for, for, for that. All right, thanks. And then the third, you believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Church, and the resurrection of the flesh. All right, so these were the three. This, this is the Apostles' Creed in, uh, in uh, interrogatory form. Uh, and, but look at these, uh, at these statements <clears throat> and how they refute uh, the heretics. All right, God the Father is almighty, meaning he is all ruling. He reigns over the material, not just the spiritual. Born of Mary, Jesus did not just appear, as Marcion taught. He is crucified under Pontius Pilate. This was a historical, dateable event. All right, and again, uh, the Gnostics uh, uh, denied that, uh, that Jesus was crucified. You remember that story from the, the treatise from Seth the Great? Um, and the other thing about the Gnostic Gospels is that none of them are dateable. None of the Gnostic Gospels refer to uh, concrete events. They just kind of exist without any, without any context. Uh, crucified, died, rose again. That's a denial of docetism, uh, which also is present in, um, in Gnosticism, but also in modalism. We'll come to judge. Remember, Marcion said that, uh, that Jesus represents the God of love and, uh, and, and denies any judgment. But the Apostles' Creed said that Jesus is going to come to judge the Holy Church against Marcion's uh, splinter church and the resurrection of the flesh denied the idea that flesh is evil. So you can see that as a person affirms the Apostles' Creed, the person is affirming uh, the Orthodox faith. And then apostolic succession was the third um, uh, institution that the church brought against uh, heresy. And uh, this, is, uh, this is in opposition to the Gnostics. They claim that Jesus passed on secret knowledge to a chosen few. Uh, but the second century church denied the existence of such secret knowledge. And they claimed that the true apostolic church was connected by succession to the apostles. Most ancient churches kept uh, lists of bishops and elders that uh, linked them uh, with, the, um, with the apostles. Uh, we, uh, Irenaeus uh, certainly kept such a list. We see, such, uh, we see lists like that in Eusebius. Uh, we know that, uh, that Irenaeus talked about his linkage uh, uh, because he was, uh, he had studied under Polycarp in Smyrna, and Polycarp had been a uh, disciple of John the Apostle. So we see how this, there's this kind of linkage uh, going on. Now, the principle of apostolic succession was not exclusive. Uh, it didn't claim a closed and secret tradition like the Gnostic teachers. It instead was inclusive, offering an open tradition based on the witness of all apostles. Okay? So this was, this was one way in which the church uh, tried to combat uh, the heretic, particularly the Gnostics, saying that our teachings uh, were passed down by, uh, by actual succession from an apostle uh, who laid hands on uh, the, the, the next bishop and so on and so forth. All right? Now, this, uh, this was opposed by uh, a couple of other traditions talk about the Montanists. They were in opposition to this idea of apostolic succession because they believed that, that uh, 
authority was was uh, was in that it was deposited in those who uh, had expressions of the Holy Spirit. So that's really part of the of the the opposition of the Montanists to the established church. Um, then we have those who uh, I, I don't think we're going to get there today, but uh, um, you talk about the uh, the monks and those who began to live ascetic lifestyles. They felt that their asceticism uh, gave uh, gave them uh, authority, or actually those who admired the ascetics said that God gave authority to them because of their their lifestyle, as opposed to. Uh, uh, apostolic succession. So <clears throat> apostolic succession was not uh, always uh, accepted uh, everywhere, but nonetheless that was the purpose for it. And of course we see it, uh, you know, uh, today we have, uh, you know, we're about to see apostolic succession enacted before our eyes as, uh, as another pope is going to be selected uh, next month. I'm going to be in Rome at that time. Which is actually kind of scary uh, to think to, to think about the crowds that are going to be there, uh, but it still will be a uh, will be a historical event. What were you saying, Leah? I said that's cool, and she said it was scary, and I said it's getting scary. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get a pope T-shirt. A pope T-shirt. Why not? If they have a pope T-shirt, I'll, a, pope tie. A, a pope tie. I'll see if I can find a pope that next time. Hmm? That, that would rock. rock. Yeah, yeah. Add to my uh, add to my uh, my uh, necktie. <laughs> you might get a Dr. Butler shirt. <laughs> a, a Dr. Butler shirt. <laughs> the Pope mine. The There you go. No one has noticed my necktie today. I did. Yeah. 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 What's what's on the top? Uh, Pope Tyrannosaurus Rex. Right. Tyrannosaurus Rex. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. No, I, I, I got it on my own. <laughs> All right, moving along, moving along. All right, the Da Vinci Code. This is what I was uh, what I was wanting to show uh, today, but I don't uh, unless unless something is going on uh, that is uh, that's not going to happen. But uh, we'll just have to get along without it. Oh wait. I have no idea why it's picking up. It's Luther. It's picking up Luther instead. So, um, so we'll just uh, we'll do um, we'll do Da Vinci Code uh, uh, the the acoustic acoustic. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, the acoustic way. I'll just I'll just carry it through the slides. All right. Uh, I think I asked this uh, before. How many of y'all have read the book? Okay. How many of y'all have seen the movie? All right. More people have seen the movie. Uh, the book is so much better uh, than the uh, than the movie, of course. But both of them are uh, are just full of false information. Uh, Dan Brown is the uh, author of several novels, uh, Angels and Demons, and The Lost symbol are, are two books that uh, with the character of Robert Langdon. Um, he actually wrote Angels and Demons uh, in 2000, uh, three years before The Da Vinci Code, but uh, The Da Vinci Code took off and became a movie, and so then they, they made the Angels and Demons movie uh, after uh, the movie Da Vinci Code. Uh, and then Lost Symbol is, um, is, uh, uh, focuses on uh, Freemasons and the Masonic Lodge and the, all the, the secret uh, society and, and all the symbolism there. Well, uh, The Da Vinci Code, uh, the book sold over 80 million copies, and through his character, Lee Teaving, Brown promoted several untruths and half-truths about early Christianity, heresies, and the canon. All right, at one point, he says that there were more than 80 Gospels that were considered for the New Testament. Now, this is bizarre. Uh, I've never seen any list uh, uh, of, of, of that would include as many as 80 uh, Gospels. There were many Gospels circulating among the Gnostic communities. But 
none of them were ever considered a part of the New Testament by anyone outside of the Gnostic community. Uh, only the four Gospels that we have uh, were ever considered for the New Testament. And as we've said, as we've seen, they were uh, established uh, before uh, uh, Gnosticism really rose up. All right, uh, Lee Teething says the Bible was collated by the pagan Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. <clears throat> well, the books of the Bible were not chosen by any one man. Okay, the process of establishing the canon uh, developed over many years and involved all the churches and the four canonical gospels were already included none of the 80 gospels referred to in the Da Vinci Code. All right, now we do know that um, that Constantine authorized the uh, uh, transcription and production of 50 Bibles, all right, which then he uh, distributed uh, through, the, through the kingdom. And all of that doesn't sound like much. We need to remember that it uh, probably took about a year uh, for a person to transcribe uh, the entire Bible, uh, and it was a very expensive, painstaking uh, process. And so this was really quite a gift uh, for him to make. Um, but uh, certainly he was not uh, he was not editing the Bible. He simply was authorizing. He was paying for. Uh, someone to, uh, to 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 do the transcription and production. All right, in the three, this is this is ridiculous. This actually is not in the book. This is in the movie. In the 300s, the Christians began a religious war against pagan Romans. Please, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. <clears throat> From 303 to 311, Christians suffered what's known as the Great Persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. I mean, seriously. Uh, the, the, the Christians numbered about 5 to 10 percent of the population. So to suggest that Christians were warring against uh, the Romans is, uh, is absurd. But, you know, uh, think about how many millions have seen, that, seen the movie and no one has stood up to say, wrong, not even close. <coughs> Uh, Lee Teeming says, until the Council of Nicaea, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet, a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless. Uh, again, the divinity of Jesus was well established by 325. Uh, the Council of Nicaea was convened to counter Arius' denial of Jesus' divinity, which was a new and disturbing theology. All right, now obviously, we, I mean, as we said, there were others before Arius, that denied Jesus' divinity. We have the Ebionites and the uh, adoptionists who emphasized his humanity. Uh, but, uh, but again, all of these were, uh, were denounced as, uh, as heretical. We've, we've talked about how uh, the hymns, uh, these rules of faith embedded in the scriptures, uh, the rules of faith uh, written by uh, church fathers uh, be, you know, in the, the, the first, second, and third centuries, before the Council of Nicaea, all established the divinity. Even, um, even when we talked about uh, Pliny the Younger, the governor of Bithynia, he knew that Christians uh, understood Jesus as divine because he said they meet together to sing hymns as to uh, uh, Christ as a God. So, anyway, this is, this is uh, again, false. Uh, that wasn't the purpose of the Council of Nicaea. Uh, Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially uh, proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Uh, and uh, uh, then, then uh, Sophie, the, the female uh, that's, uh, that's going along with Robert Langdon, says, hold on, you're saying Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote? And Lee Teeming says, a relatively close vote at that. Well, no. Uh, of the approximately 250 bishops in attendance, only two refused to sign the Creed of Nicaea that affirmed Jesus' full divinity, and that was not a close vote at all. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, anyway, he's, he's trying to make it act, seem as if, as if there was a vote that determined it. So, uh, anyway, 
anyway, there wasn't anyway that wasn't there wasn't a close vote. Well, now this is interesting. This comes from the book. It's not in the movie. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 1950s, hidden in a cave near Qumran, and the Coptic Scrolls in 1945 at Nag Hammadi. These documents speak of Christ's ministry in very human terms. The Dead Sea Scrolls are all Hebrew scriptures, or they are uh, they're, they're manuals of, uh, of church order written by those of the Qumran community. Uh, the Qumran community was, uh, was abandoned in 70 AD when, uh, uh, when the Romans uh, uh, were fighting against the, the, the Jewish revolt. So there's nothing in the Dead Sea Scrolls about Christ at all, human or divine, nothing about Christ at all. So uh, that's, that's obviously poor research on Dan Brown's part. Um, and the, uh, the Gnostic documents discovered in uh, Nag Hammadi actually um, deny Jesus' humanity to the point of docetism. I mean, that's the point of Gnosticism, is that they, they, uh, they, they deny that he was human. They, uh, they say that he only appeared to be human. Uh, uh, you know, Gnostics believe that Jesus did not leave footprints on the sand. And so when Dan Brown tries to say that these Gnostic Gospels were eliminated because they insisted on Jesus' humanity, that is quite the opposite of the nature of the Gnostic Gospels. Okay? And Dan Brown either knows this and is lying, or he's just... Uh, he's got some presuppositions that he's wanting to promote, but either way, he's, 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 he's very deceptive. The Gnostic Gospels reveal glaring historical discrepancies and fabrications, <coughs> clearly confirming that the modern Bible was compiled and edited by men who possessed a political agenda. Well, uh, skeptics like Bart Ehrman and Elaine Pagels and Dan Brown argue that the Gnostic Gospels are as valid as the canonical Gospels. Uh, and that the established church suppressed them. But if you read the Gnostic Gospels, they're clearly inferior in style, content, and theology to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, of course, you know that the big uh, the, the point behind the Da Vinci Code is that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, um, and then they quote the Gospel of, of Philip, um, how the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene, but uh, the truth is that the Gospel of Philip was composed in the third century. <clears throat> the canonical Gospels were completed and circulating by the end of the first. The canonical Gospels picture Mary Magdalene as a woman healed by Jesus and as a close friend who witnessed his resurrection, but not as his wife. And when you see the text of the, uh, the, uh, the papyrus that is the, uh, the Gospel of uh, Philip, it's broken and unclear. I think we, we talked about this uh, when we talked about the Gnostic Gospels, and I showed you how the, there were gaps. So Dan Brown filled in the blanks with his own <coughs> imagination. Then, then the, uh, Dan, you know, Lee Teabing says that Mary Magdalene wrote her own Gospel, the Gospel of Mary. Well, the Gospel of Mary was written in the second century by a member of the Gnostic community writing in the name of Mary. Um, actually doesn't even identify herself as Mary Magdalene simply as Mary uh, but I have no reason to think that, that this writer was not writing in the name of Mary Magdalene um, <clears throat> we talked about these three uh, Walter Bauer who uh, created the thesis that uh, that heresies developed uh, what we call heresies were simply alternative Christianities that developed at the same time as what we call orthodoxy. Orthodoxy being that form of Christian theology that, uh, that developed in Rome, but then as, as Rome extended uh, her, uh, her, her uh, wealth and influence and power, and particularly after Constantine, then the Orthodox Church uh, was able to, to dominate Christendom and rewrite history uh, in its favor. Bart Ehrman carries this uh, forward in his book, Lost Christianities, 
so much so that uh, it's that this uh, theory is now called the bauer ehrman thesis. And Elaine Pagels uh, is another one who says that the Gnostic Gospels are equally authoritative uh, with uh, the canonical scriptures. We talked about these books um, and, uh, and other authors uh, who are excellent uh, sources for you to, uh, to read. Well, um, this, uh, this is just a summary of the priority of orthodoxy. Um, and I would just say, I just close this part of the lecture by saying the story of Christian theology is the story of truth. Okay? So this, this kind of wraps up what we, you know, last week we talked about the heresies. This week I wanted to talk about the church's responses to the heresies. Okay? The rule of faith, uh, the canon of scripture, the creeds, and uh, uh, apostolic succession. Okay, we're not ready to finish up. I've still got, I think I still have, what time? What time do you have? Okay, good. My, my, my battery is, uh, is dying. It does this like twice a year. I just, mm. Anyway, so I, it, it's, it's, I'm losing time, but I'm still okay. I'm still okay. So we still have a little bit of time left, and I want to, uh, to talk a, a little bit more uh, to you today. But has anybody had any questions about what we've looked at? All right. I, I, mostly I want you to see the importance of the topic and why it's important to learn church history. <clears throat> because these people that we just looked at, uh, uh, especially you know Ehrman and Pagel uh, and, and Dan Brown, these people are being, their books are being read, uh, the movies are being seen, uh, these people are being uh, invited to uh, the History Channel, and uh, and they are they're communicating. To our people and their and, and and then to the community at large, so we need to be prepared to deliver an apologetic. And although although I am a big supporter of Bible study, I teach the Bible on Thursday nights. It's why it's so important to me. So yes, we need to be teaching the Bible in our churches, preaching the Bible in our churches. But if we're not teaching church history, we're not giving our people the foundation that they need upon which to build their faith and defend that faith against our culture that is increasingly a skeptical, pluralistic, and hostile. Yes, Cody? I've always had a lot of coworkers that may be unsure and not know a lot about Christianity, but they just watch the Yes, it is, and uh, uh, we, you know, we we may not be aware of it because we, you know, we may see that and just, you know, reject it outright or turn it off. Uh, but we need to be aware that that other people are are watching it. I think it's the History Channel is about to start a a series on the Bible. Oh, I just cannot wait to hear what they have to say about uh, the Bible. Yes, Dwayne. Do you know? Do you still have? Have you seen any books anything that deal with the apocalypse? Well, um, when I did, uh, talking about the apocalypse of Peter, when I did uh, my book on uh, the Passion of Perpetua, uh, it seemed to me that I saw uh, some, uh, some influences from the apocalypse of Peter on the writers of the Passion. And so, you know, uh, I'm, I, I'm thinking that it was that it, it was read by that community, and it found its way into some of the uh, <clears throat> the uh, prophetic materials in the Passion. Uh, so, uh, you know, along those regards, you you might look at might look at my book. Uh, it's uh, it's in the library. Uh, if you want to buy it from Amazon, I think it's five hundred dollars right now. So, I recommend that you check it out from the library. Uh, but uh, chapter three does look at allusions to the Apocalypse of Peter. And probably I would have some footnotes that would might send you to some secondary sources on the Apocalypse of Peter. 
<coughs> certainly the apocalypse itself is, uh, is probably available, the text is available online if you want to, to read it. It's, uh, it is uh, unusual. It was, uh, it was omitted from the canon for obvious reasons. Okay. All right. Well, let us uh, let us turn our attention to um, the uh, the union of church and state because this is a development during this period of time that is uh, extremely important and has had an effect not only on the early church but on the church uh, really through the ages uh, even until now. <clears throat> well, first of all, let's talk about the Christianizing of the empire. Now, when, uh, uh, when we talked about persecution in here, we did not really deal with the end of persecution, which came about with the conversion of Constantine, uh, or at least the alleged conversion of Constantine. But you've seen the notes, you've read the textbook, and so you're familiar with the story of Constantine's um, uh, vision and uh, the, the impact it had on his personal life and then on the church. Uh, as he was, he was uh, fighting, uh, he was at war against uh, Maxentius. Uh, uh, they, they were the two rulers in the West, and uh, Constantine was going to take control of the western half of the empire. So he went to war against Maxentius. He was approaching uh, Rome, and uh, uh, Maxentius foolishly left his stronghold in Rome to come out and confront uh, Constantine, and that battle was going to take place at the Milvian Bridge. And the night uh, before the, the battle, uh, Constantine saw this vision uh, that was uh, the, um, uh, the the Kai Ro. He saw the uh, the Kai uh, imposed over the Ro, uh, and uh, uh, heard a voice say, "In this sign, you will conquer." And as part of this vision or dream. Uh, he, uh, he felt that, uh, that Jesus was telling him that if he would put this symbol on his soldiers' shields, that he would win the battle. So, he did so. And in fact, he did defeat Maxentius. And in fact, Maxentius fell off the bridge into the Million, Million River and drowned. All right. So, following this experience, uh, Constantine then began to show favor toward uh, Christianity. All right now, he he uh, um, he. This was in 312, uh, and in 313, he uh, he and uh, Licentius, who was the emperor in the east, made a, made a pact and called it the Edict of. They did it in Milan. So it's called the Edict of Milan that legalized Christianity and essentially ended persecution of Christians. At least in the West, when Constantine went to war against Licentius, uh, then Licentius uh, uh, did not follow that edict and in fact began to persecute Christians again in the East. It was during that period of time that we had the story of the 40 martyrs of Sebast, uh, which uh, I won't take time to tell you now, but look it up, great story. But anyway, so, so we do still have some persecution in the East, but at least Constantine um, uh, ruled in favor of Christians. All right, and then uh, throughout his life, and then of course he, he eventually defeated Licentius, united the, uh, uh, the empire, and uh, ended persecution uh, everywhere. All right, so there are questions about Constantine's conversion. Okay, uh, certainly was a, was a very unusual event. Uh, and so the question is, did Constantine actually convert? All right. Uh, and then what about his continued involvement with uh, paganism? Because he continued to participate in pagan rituals. 
Uh, his coins included symbols of the unconquered sun, Saul and Winctus. Uh, and in fact, his father had worshipped Saul and Winctus, which was a kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a, a, a pagan god that uh, worshipped the, the worship obviously was centered in the worship of the sun, uh, but nonetheless, that was a symbol of some great divine power. Um, he uh, considered himself the high priest of, the, of, of Roman paganism. He still referred to himself as Pontifex Maximus, the great bridge between uh, the gods and humanity. All right, so he continued to be involved in uh, the pagan religion. Um, There's a question about whether he simply used Christianity as the cement of the empire, as if he wanted to unite the empire around Christianity. Of course, previous emperors uh, had attempted to, to use uh, the, uh, the worship of, of the Roman gods or the emperor worship as a means of uniting the empire. That's why they had persecuted the Christians so severely, because the Christians would not participate in either the worship of the pagan gods or the worship of the emperor. <clears throat> if this were Constantine's goal, it would be kind of unusual for him to use Christianity because at this time, probably at the most, only 10% of uh, the population of the empire uh, could be counted as Christian. However, uh, I will say that, the, that, that Christianity was widespread and Christianity was present in just about every major city throughout the empire. So in that sense, it was widespread, but it was far from uh, a, a, a big percentage of the empire. <clears throat> and then also, uh, it's, it's said that uh, Constantine delayed his baptism until his death. Therefore, Constantine could not be considered a Christian throughout his lifetime. Well, there are other explanations for the delay of his baptism. And that is, uh, I think we've talked before in here about the, uh, the idea of post-baptismal forgiveness. Right? There was the teaching that, uh, once a that baptism washed away all previous sins, but what do you do about sins committed after baptism? Right. There was a, a, a major teaching, it's, it's included in the Shepherd of Hermas uh, and others, that, uh, that you could only commit one uh, mortal sin after baptism. All right. Of course, mortal sin being um, uh, adultery, uh, denying uh, faith in Christ, uh, murder, sexual sin, those kinds of things, those, those were major mortal sins, venial sin uh, could be forgiven by the church, but only one instance of mortal sin could be committed and be forgiven by the church. We talked about exomologesis and the kind of extreme penance that, that was required. Okay, so uh, if someone uh, is fearful of committing post-baptismal sin, and particularly uh, this was a problem for those in uh, in magisterial roles, political roles, because they were involved in um, uh, ca uh, ordering capital punishment or issuing declarations of war, and so there was uh, there was concern among those in politics about post baptismal sin. That's why uh, um, that's one of the reasons why Cyprian had not been baptized. Ambrose was not baptized until. Uh, late, I, I didn't mean Cyprian, I meant Ambrose was baptized late in life. All right, so it could be that Constantine uh, was concerned about post-baptismal repentance and forgiveness, and that's why he delayed his baptism. Many people would delay their baptism until their deathbed uh, because they felt that, uh, that they would give them less opportunity to commit a major sin. All right, now for us, uh, you know, we don't understand forgiveness that way, but they did then. So that may be why Constantine delayed his baptism. All right, so uh, there are, these are some serious, 
serious questions. You know, I don't think <clears throat> that anybody in this class has chosen Constantine as a topic for a research paper. Am I overlooking someone? So, if you haven't picked a topic yet, this might be a good uh, good topic and a good question to uh, to pursue. Anyway, we'll move on. Um, whether Christian or not, Constantine encouraged the transformation of the empire from a pagan state church to a Christian state church. All right, and and this development cannot be uh, the importance of it cannot be overstated. Now, remember that the only model that Constantine had ever seen was the union of religion and state. Okay, again, this was this was what uh, the Roman Empire had. Uh, this was the structure of the Roman Empire uh, always that uh, that they were that they that they had an official uh, state-sponsored religion that is the worship of the Roman gods, headed by uh, the uh, the worship of the emperor. All right, uh, so. If, if Constantine is going to convert to Christianity, then he is going to unite the empire with uh, Christianity, the worship of Christ. <clears throat> so, but it did take a gradual process. You see, he began to appoint Christians to offices. Uh, he ordered the destruction of pagan temples. This is interesting. He removed pagan idols from the temples and then displayed them publicly as works of art, thereby denigrating them, all right? Uh, the, the, uh, in the Roman Empire, one was accustomed to going into a temple and worshiping at uh, the, uh, the statue of Zeus or of Apollos or of Venus uh, or of Diana, all right? But he took these statues and he just put them on display at the public square. So they lost their religious significance. That's just, that's just an interesting, uh, interesting thing. Also, uh, this probably began during the time of Constantine, but, uh, but continued on, that uh, the Christians then would take over the pagan temples and convert them into uh, places of Christian worship. I could cite a number of examples, but I'm just going to cite one, and that is uh, the, the place in Rome called the Pantheon. Uh, the Pantheon was called such because you walked in, and this uh, this uh, this rotunda was lined with uh, twelve statues of the twelve members of the Pantheon, the uh, uh, the highest uh, gods of Roman worship. Well, the church took it over. They they removed all of the statues of uh, the Roman gods and replaced them with. Christian martyrs and uh, Christian leaders. And so you go in now, and that's what you'll, that's what you'll see: the statues of of the, the of, uh, of uh, those whom the Christians wanted to honor. So that's just another way that uh, that the pagan temples <coughs> were either destroyed <coughs> or converted. All right. Uh, Constantine donated property and money for churches uh, in the late third century, in the late 200s, uh, in the period of time between, it was, about, it was about 50 years where there was no persecution going on in the Roman Empire. So during this time, we see uh, the building of churches uh, starting to develop. We actually see some large churches being built. We talked about uh, the church that's been found at Dura Europas, um, but there are even bigger churches being built uh, during this time. Well, all of this, all of these buildings, all the property was confiscated during the great persecution led by Diocletian and then Galerius. Uh, so Constantine restored the property and even donated money for the building of, for the rebuilding of churches. And it was during this time that his mother, Helena, went to uh, uh, Israel and they began calling it the Holy Land. They began pilgrimages. Uh, to the Holy Land, and Helena uh, is the one who uh, who settled on the sites of, uh, of the Nativity. So she decided the site for the Church of the Nativity, for the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, where uh, uh, we have Calvary and uh, the tomb uh, is, uh, is, uh, is commemorated, and then the Church of the Ascension, 
And so these three signs uh, were, uh, were developed by uh, his mother, Helena, and then and, and he uh, funded the building of, of churches in these places. When you go there now, of course, the buildings that are there are much later, but nonetheless, uh, they, they were started there. He provided, oh my word, uh, he provided funds for, uh, for bishops to travel to the councils, gave his sons a Christian education, a lot of legislation involved, uh, and <clears throat> we're going to pick up right here uh, next week. Mercy, didn't that 50 minutes just fly by? You just didn't even know that, uh, that, uh, that he was going by. Thank you so much for your attention today, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Remember that you've got uh, uh, your uh, movie review. <laughs>